In D&D 5th edition, each class gains something new whenever they level up, whether that be learning new spells, a new class or subclass feature, or gaining increased stats via your ability score improvements. And the purpose of gaining these new abilities is to make your character feel stronger as the campaign progresses. However, in this video, we'll be going over some of the worst features you can learn from classes and subclasses, which either have a very little impact on the power level of your character from a roleplay or combat perspective, or are just too niche to really make use out of in general. And at number 10, we have Counter Charm. This is a 6th level bard feature, which allows you to spend an action to give friendly creatures within 30 feet of you advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed, until the end of your next turn. And since this is a feature where you must be vocal, only creatures that are able to hear you can benefit off of this feature, while being incapacitated or silenced will automatically cause the feature to end early. You can also end the performance early at any given time without spending any action. Having an advantage on being frightened and charmed is pretty good since both conditions can be very annoying to deal with as being frightened gives you disadvantage in all ability checks and attack rolls while the source of your fear is in line of sight while also preventing the frightened creature from moving any closer to the source of the condition. Meanwhile, being charmed basically means you can't attack or harm the charmer while the charmer has advantage on social interactions with you. That being said, there are two major problems with counter charm. The first is that it uses your action, which is an extremely valuable resource to spend on your turn, in order to grant your party members advantage on the affirmation conditions for only a single turn. This means that you're not really doing anything for the rest of your turn unless you're giving out bardic inspirations, which admittedly does combo pretty well with counter charm, since a creature about to be hit with frighten or charm can use the bardic inspiration to give themselves a slightly better chance to resist the effect. But this goes into Counter Charm's second flaw, which is the fact that it doesn't actually end the conditions of being frightened or charmed. This means that if you have a party member that's already frightened or charmed, then this feature only really helps them if they have to redo the saving throw against either effect. Because of the way this feature works, you also can't really use Counter Charm as a way to prevent charm or frightening from occurring in the first place unless you're spending every action before combat using it, or know for sure that a creature is going to cast something like Fear or Charm Person. In which case, you're better off having your wizard or sorcerer use Counterspell instead. Or waiting until 10th level to take Counterspell yourself via Magical Secrets feature that just lets you take spells from any spell list of your choosing. Actually, if you really want to prevent you and your party from being frightened or charmed, you can always learn Combo Motions as one of your second level bard spells. As it basically does what Counter Charm wants to do, albeit the cost of a second level spell slot. Essentially, you create a 20-foot radius sphere centered around a point you choose within 60 feet and force humanoid creatures within that sphere to make charisma saving throws, with the added caveat that creatures may willingly choose to fail the saving throw in order to gain the effects of one of the following outcomes for failing the saving throw. You can make creatures indifferent about other creatures of your choice that it was hostile towards and ends if the target is attacked or harmed by a spell or if it witnesses any of its friends being harmed. More importantly, in this case, you can suppress the frightening and charm conditions affecting the creature for the duration of the spell, where the conditions will resume unless the effects that were in place have expired. This basically allows you to immediately get rid of the frightened and charmed effects on your allies immediately, so long as they remain within this sphere. And even though Calm Emotions only suppresses these conditions, one minute is usually more than enough time to end a combat, and thus ending the source of either condition by way of violence. Or, alternatively, you can use this to combo with Counter Charm since the affected creatures will still most likely have to make saving throws to try and end the conditions that were affected them in the first place, such as the Fear spell where you can repeat your saving throw if you're no longer within line of sight of your source of fear. While Counter Charm isn't inherently bad, it's a bit niche compared to a lot of the other features, and if you have a Paladin in the party, then half of this feature is kind of useless since they can just suppress or prevent creatures from being frightened altogether via their Aura of Courage feature that they get at 10th level which grants them a 10-foot aura that's always on and does what was just explained. And if that paladin happens to be an Oath of Devotion paladin, then they also gain another aura for being charmed at 7th level, which can further limit the uses of Counter Charm. While you'll still be able to use Counter Charm to help end being frightened or charmed in every case mentioned, this doesn't detract from the biggest problem it has, which is using your action, which is usually better spent casting calm emotions or any other spell that might be helpful to a party, such as Bless, Hold Person, Shatter, or even Fireball, if you take it via your Magical Secrets feature, which is why Counter Charm sits at number 10 on this list. And at number 9, we have Enthralling Performance. This feature belongs to the College of Glamour subclass for Bards and basically allows you to, once per short or long rest, attempt to charm creatures up to your Charisma modifier and within 60 feet of you that you have performed in front of for at least one minute. Affected creatures must succeed a Wisdom saving throw against your spell DC to avoid being charmed, but it has no realization that you were attempting to charm if they succeed. 
making this feature pretty much safe to use whenever you have it. And creatures that are charmed by this feature idolize you and may even fight on your behalf if they're already inclined to do so, such as a grateful guard you helped out a while ago. Bud ends after one hour, if they take any damage, if you attacked it, or witness you attacking or damaging any of the creature's allies. This feature is pretty amazing for social campaigns where you're going to be meeting and greeting a lot of people, such as castles, cities, taverns, and so on. They can be a great way to get information on important people and places around the local area, as well as gathering secrets in ways you might not have been able to before due to the sour reputation or lack of acquaintanceships. However, the problem with this feature mostly comes from the fact that, oftentimes, DMs may or may not unknowingly treat regular bard performances with this feature's benefits anyway, since a performing bard can calm the mood in any situation. That's not to say that this feature is totally useless, however. If your DM doesn't allow performances to make social interactions easier, then enthralling performance is definitely a strong feature to have. And if your DM does allow performance to help social interactions, then this feature can actually reinforce the playstyle and even work as a wonderful flavor option for characters striding to become famous or well-known in an area due to the fact that you'll be temporarily idolized and praised. While enthralled performance isn't terrible, it is severely limited to how your DM decides how they want performance checks to influence social outcomes. However, being able to have the chance to charm creatures for free without any risk once per short rest is a nice enough feature to have that it only takes number 9 on this list. And at number 8, we have Hide in Plain Sight. This is the 10th level class feature that rangers get and allows you to spend 1 minute camouflaging yourself in fresh mud, dirt, plants, suit, and other naturally occurring materials to give yourself a passive plus 10 bonus to your stealth checks as long as you're not moving or taking any actions. Once you move or take an action or reaction, the camouflage falls off and you must spend another minute reapplying it. This feature is amazing if you ever need to remain in one area for an extended period of time. A flat plus 10 to your stealth combos well with a more recent optional class feature introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, Canny, which allows you to have expertise in one of your skill proficiencies. So, if you combine Hide in Plain Sight with expertise in stealth checks, you are basically stealthier than any rogue you could ever come across, especially if you then combine this with Pass Without Trace, giving you another flat 10% bonus to your stealth. However, that's really where the usefulness of this spell ends. The bonus granted by Hide in Plain Sight only applies to you and requires you to spend a minute to set up, which means that you don't want to use this feature in a time-heavy scenario. This feature might be good for hunting for food while traveling, or maybe gathering information between strangers on the open road. However, if you really want that plus 10 bonus to stealth in a pinch, you're better off concentrating on the aforementioned Pass Without Trace spell, which rangers can learn as a second level spell, and applies the stealth bonus to their nearby allies as well. Pass Without Trace also comes with the added benefit of making it so that you can't be tracked unless it's by magical means, as you and affected creatures no longer leave tracks or traces of passage so long as you're within the spell's radius. And since the spell can last for up to one hour, it can be very useful for stealthy traversing large expanses of the map, even if you have someone in your party that's wearing armor that provides them disadvantage on stealth checks since even a plus 10 bonus is enough to mitigate the disadvantage in most cases. Overall, Hide in Plain Sight is a feature that provides a nice stealth bonus in situations where you want to remain in one spot, but because you get it so late, and because Pass Without Trace is available much earlier, as soon as you reach 5th level, there really isn't any way to make great use of this feature since Pass Without Trace does what this feature wants to do but better unless you really want to stack stealth bonuses for whatever reason. The reason this feature sits higher on this list than Counter Charm, however, is the fact that you learn Counter Charm much earlier, so there's many more chances to use it as opposed to Hide in Plain Sight being a 10th level feature, which is pretty much endgame for most campaigns. There's also the fact that even though both features are easily outclassed by spells, Counter Charm at least combos with the spell that outclasses it much better than Hide in Plain Sight combos with Pass Without Trace. However, what keeps this feature from being any higher on this list is due to the fact that you don't actually have to take this feature. You see, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything introduces a lot of optional features you can either take alongside your normal features, or replace certain features with a new one. Hide in Plain Sight is one of those features where you're allowed to replace with a much better feature, Nature's Veil. In short, Nature's Veil lets you use your bonus action to become invisible until the start of your next turn, proficiency times a day. Becoming invisible on command is just infinitely better than trying to spend a minute trying to give yourself a plus 10 bonus to your stealth and eliminating any side-based vision where you can see. Instead, cast Pass Without Trace and use Nature's Veil to do the same thing in much less time. And at number 7, we have Detect Portal. This is a third level subclass feature you learn as a Horizon Walker Ranger. It allows you to use your action to detect the distance and direction of the nearest planar portal within one mile of you. And that's really all there is to this feature. It can be useful for finding the origin of an invasion of demons, for instance, 
or find a really important portal for plot related reasons. But that's really it. Unless a campaign has a heavy focus on portals, Detect Portal is just not active in most campaigns. However, on the off chance that there are portals to be found, and if your DM is willing to work with you on getting some use of this feature, Detect Portals is actually pretty useful and great, as it can help enhance the player experience when playing a Horizon Walker Ranger. But because this can only be used once per short long rest, you do still have to be careful how and when you use the ability, since if you use it too early or too late, you'll risk spending more time than needed looking for a certain portal if you know there was one in the general area. As for why this feature only takes number 7 on this list despite seeming a bit useless? Well, unlike the other entries we'll be going over, this feature still does its job phenomenally well whenever it comes up and doesn't really have any rivaled features or spells that outclass it. It's just the fact that, other than this one niche case it's useful for, this feature is just outright useless and wants to be used in very specific campaigns. And at number 6, we have Divine Health. This is a feature you learn as a paladin at 3rd level and makes you immune to all diseases. Being able to not be affected by diseases such as Cackle Fever, Super Plague, and Sight Rot, all of which are featured in the Dungeons Master's Guide, is incredibly useful to have as some of these diseases can have a lot of debilitating effects. Caco Fever, for example, forces you to take psychic damage and become stuck in a laughing fit for a minute whenever you enter combat, taking damage, experiencing fear, having nightmares, or any other kind of stressful situation, and could potentially cause you to contract a form of indefinite madness if you fail through saving throws against fighting off the disease at the end of each long rest. And these are just some of the deadly diseases you might come into contact with during the duration of a campaign. There are some monsters that can have their own form of disease in their stat block, such as an Aboleth, which possesses a tentacle attack that deals 3d6 plus 5 bludgeon damage and inflicts a disease onto its target that makes its skin translucent and become totally reliant on being underwater in order to recover lost hit points and to not take 1d12 acid damage for every 10 minutes it spends out of water. However, just like Detect Portal, diseases aren't really something that DMs normally play with. Sure, there may be diseases thrown out here and there through certain encounters or campaign settings, but you're not likely to be running into potential diseases every single day. And even if you are afflicted with disease, you can easily cure most of them via the Lesser Restoration spell, which is a second level spell that's readily available to artificers, bards, clerics, druids, paladins, and even rangers, and a bunch of other subclasses, and allows you to end the effects of diseases or conditions that's affected a target such as blinded, deafened, paralyzed, or poisoned. Not to mention that it's not uncommon for towns to have a priest or healer who specializes in curing diseases and curses that a party might be afflicted with, albeit for a mere pittance of coin. Really, the only active use out of divine health you might get during combat is the benefit of being totally immune to the Contagion spell, a 5th level spell that has the ability to inflict one of six deadly diseases for seven days when you fail three constitution saving throws against it, with flesh rot being among the deadliest of the bunch, since it makes you vulnerable to all damage types and gives you disadvantage on charisma checks. However, the reason Divine Health takes number 6 on this list is because, unlike Detect Portal, there are just too many ways to cure diseases very quickly if you happen to run into any. However, just like Detect Portal, it's still one of those abilities that can be a lifesaver and fulfill its main purpose extremely well when diseases do happen to be a thing. And being obtained at their level and having the benefit of always being on is also a nice bonus, which keeps this feature from being any higher on this list. And at number 5, we have a two-way tie between the Mantle of Whispers and Imposter. Mantle of Whispers is a feature you can learn as a 6th level College of Whispers bard, while Imposter is a feature learned at 13th level by Assassination Rogues, and both serve a similar function, but go about it in different ways. First, let's go over Mantle of Whispers. In short, this feature basically allows you to capture the shadow of a humanoid creature you kill within 30 feet of you once per short or long rest, while the retained shadow itself is only retained until you use it or finish a long rest. As an action, you may choose to use the shadow, causing it to vanish and bestow upon you a disguise perfectly matching the person whose shadow you captured for one hour, or until you end the disguise using your bonus action. While disguised in this way, you gain enough information and knowledge from that creature to share with a casual acquaintance, such as details about their background or personal life. Basically, just enough knowledge to pass yourself off as that person, so no secrets or key information you might want to actually know. And if a creature decides to inspect you for any reason, they'd have to pass an insight check contested against your deception, and then a plus 5 bonus to your deception check for being so lifelike with your disguise. Overall, this feature is basically a better version of Disguise Self, a first level spell that basically does what this just described, but with a couple of very minor key differences. The biggest difference the Mantle of Whispers has over Disguise Self is the fact that Disguise Self is purely an illusion. 
meaning it might be easy to accidentally ruin your disguise if they happen to bump into you, or try to reach for a hat that you made as part of the spell since their hand would just phase right through it. And with the way Mantle Whispers is worded, you essentially become the person whose shadow has been captured, implying that whatever clothes you're wearing are your actual clothes. Basically, Mantle Whispers is a safer option to use in Disguise Self purely because it's not necessarily illusion-based. However, because Disguise Self is readily available at first level, the only real benefit to using Mantle Whispers is to better infiltration disguise by also being able to recall some very basic knowledge in case you get pulled aside by a guard for questioning, for instance. There's also the fact that you do have to kill a creature in order to disguise yourself as that person, which can have its own consequences depending on the campaign and setting while Disguise Self would at least let you disguise yourself as the person without needing to harm a gar that might have had a family or pet dog waiting for them at home. As for the imposter, this feature allows you to spend three hours to study a person's speech, mannerisms, and handwriting and learn how to perfectly mimic the way they speak, their behavioral patterns, and the way they write, allowing you to pass off anything you do as that person to any casual observer. And if someone actually does become suspicious and think you're an imposter, you can make a deception check to avoid being found out and have advantage to boot. This feature works extremely well when combined with a Disguise Kit, since you most likely wouldn't have access to something like Disguise Self without multiclassing or taking feats. On its own, Imposter doesn't really have any uses outside of maybe forging letters to make them seem like they're being written by an imposter person or politician. But when coupled with a Disguise Kit or the Seeming Spell, a 5th level spell that works just as an AoE version of Disguise Self and lasts for 8 hours, you can probably get a lot of use out of this feature. However, just like Mantle Whispers, these features are just too niche to see regular play. Unless your campaign has a much heavier focus on roleplaying, in which case these two features can work remarkably well as a ways to augment your disguise. But if we had to choose, Mantle Whispers might be considered more generally useful, as it's available much earlier and can make the Bard's Words of Terror a feature that allows the bard to speak to a creature alone for at least one minute before initiating a wisdom saving throw to avoid being frightened of you for one hour, a little easier to pull off. As for the reason why both of these features sit the number 5 spot on this list, both of these features are equally niche as mentioned earlier and really only serve as a way to supplement already existing ways to disguise oneself. Even with Mantle Whispers being available at 6th level, both Mantle Whispers and Imposter come in a little too late to really have enough time to shine as most of your infiltration and spying will most likely come from Disguise Self or a Disguise Kit already. And at number 4 we have Master of Nature. This is a feature you can learn at 17th level as a Nature Domain Cleric, and allows you to use a bonus action to verbally command creatures charmed by your Charm Animal and Plants feature, and tell them what each of them will do on their next turn. Charm Animal and Plants is a Channel Divinity feature that you learn at 2nd level when you take this domain subclass, and, as an action, forces beasts and plants within 30 feet of you to make wisdom saving throws, or become charmed by you for 1 minute or until it takes damage. Being able to charm two entire categories of creatures is a very powerful ability to have, and being able to essentially dominate these creatures into doing your bidding sounds even better on paper. However, there are some glaring issues with Master of Nature that are big enough that it gets to take this on this list over Charm Animal and Plants. The first issue with this feature is that you have to rely on another class feature in order to be able to make use of Master of Nature in the first place. The second is that the number of plants and beasts you'll end up encountering at 17th level are fairly low. Unless your DM homebrews high level encounters or has a reason to attack the party with low level creatures, the highest CR value or encounter for plants is CR9, while the highest encounter for beasts is CR8. This is also another reason why Master of Nature takes us on this list over the actual channel divinity itself. Charm Animals and Plants is learned very early and would reasonably see use throughout its lifetime, whereas Master of Nature would rarely see any play outside of specialized encounters or D&D settings that have a heavier focus on taking down wildlife. And because Master of Nature requires such a high level of commitment to even learn, it ends up being underwhelming as Nature Cleric's capstone despite how strong the effect of this feature can be, which is why it takes such a high spot on this list. And at number 3 we have Words of Terror, which we went over briefly earlier in this video. But to recap it in more detail, this is the third level subclass feature you'll learn as a College of Whispers Bard, which allows you to, once per short or long rest, attempt to frighten one humanoid creature after you spent at least one minute alone speaking with it by making a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC. When it fails, the creature becomes frightened of you or another creature of your choice for one hour, or until it's attacked, damaged, or witnesses its allies being attacked or damaged. When the creature succeeds, they would have no idea that you tried to frighten it, making this a very safe feature to use whenever it feels appropriate. This feature can be a good way to loosen the tongue of a key creature you might be having trouble prying information out of, or even as a way to plant the seeds of doubt in someone. 
Maybe you can have the king's cook become paranoid of the king with fear of being replaced, which might make them more likely to slip away secrets to your party or more likely to convince them to go against the king in other ways. However, getting someone alone long enough to use his feature can be kind of a gamble, since most of the time you don't want your party to be split for too long in case something goes wrong. And in a way, this feature works very similar to the Glamour Bard's enthralling performance, where you can charm entire groups of creatures and might even have better results since charmed creatures would naturally have looser tongues to spit out important information than a single frightened creature that you may have to set up some alone time with. But if you're going for a more subdued method of information gathering or manipulation, then Words of Terror is a much better option for this. However, overall, for a third level feature that gives you a chance to frighten a single creature while having one minute prep time to even attempt, you're much better off trying to talk to them normally with your party, or have someone cast Suggestion, and Cause Fear, Charm Person, or the many other spells or features that get a similar result. However, having a single shot chance to frighten someone with a recharge speed of a single short rest is still nice to have, and is what keeps this feature from taking a higher spot on this list, as the next two entries are leagues apart compared to some of the other entries on this list. And at number two, we have Intimidating Presence. This is a 10th level subclass feature learned by Berserker Barbarians and allows you to use your action to attempt to frighten one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. If the creature can see or hear you, it then must make a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of you until the end of your next turn. Afterwards, you can use your action to extend the duration of the frightened effect until the end of your next turn each time you do so. And the effect ends if the creature ends its turn either by being out of line of sight of you or more than 60 feet away from you. If the creature succeeds their saving throw against this feature, then you can't use on the creature again for 24 hours. Now, the first problem with this feature comes into play when looking at the saving throw DC of the ability. The DC of the saving throw is equal to 8, plus your proficiency bonus, plus your charisma modifier, which is already a red flag when it comes to playing a class that favors strength, dexterity, and constitution over all else. Most subclasses that include a stat that isn't normally used for a class are usually included in the subclass early enough that you might want to either respec or choose a different subclass altogether. A lot of tier 1 campaigns start at around 3rd level so a player might want to create an Eldritch Knight or a Battlemaster Fighter, which might want to switch around some stats in favor of more intelligence for Eldritch Knights, or more dexterity and charisma for some of the Battlemaster Fighter maneuvers. And even if players don't start at their level, these features happen early enough that you can plan your stats around some of these changes. But right from the get-go, Barbarians immediately favor high strength for their Rage feature and Reckless Attacks, high Constitution for higher hit points and AC via their Unarmed Defense feature, and high dexterity for more initiative, AC, and better dexterity saving throws, which makes dangerous sense much stronger for them, but not the most important thing for them to focus on. And while you might want some amount of charisma so that you can specialize more intimidation, it's not really as useful as beating things to death, since chances are you'll have a high charisma character somewhere in your party. But the biggest and most important flaw of this feature is the fact that you have to use your action in order to use it. This is important for one very important reason, your rage mechanic. As a barbarian, you want to take the brunt of damage and attacks that are coming your party's way. What makes this sort of playstyle important is the fact that, while you're raging, you have resistance to all physical damage. However, whenever you enter your rage, it lasts for one minute, but will end early if you don't meet the conditions for maintaining your rage. While your rage ends prematurely if you're knocked unconscious, or ended willingly by using your bonus action, it can also end early if you don't take damage or haven't attacked a hostile creature since your last turn. What this means for Intimidating Presence is, if you choose to use your action to use this feature, and you haven't taken any damage since your last turn, your rage would immediately end since Intimidating Presence isn't an attack. So there's a level of caution that needs to be considered when using this feature. But since this feature requires you to use your action every turn to maintain the fear effect, you're ultimately left with choosing whether or not to end your rage or end the Intimidating Presence, or even worse, not use Rage at all. What makes this even worse is that if you're using the Berserker Barbarian's Frenzy feature, which allows you to make one additional weapon attack each turn while raging, there's a very real risk that you'll end up dropping Rage and accumulating levels of exhaustion as per the cost of using the Frenzy feature. At the end of the day, Intimidating Presence just doesn't synergize well with the Berserker Barbarian and doesn't really do anything that other spells and features of other classes can do much better. Maybe if Intimidating Presence allowed you to replace one of your attacks with it, it would at least be worth taking 10 levels of the subclass to get it. But as it is, there's not really any use for this feature existing, which is why it takes number two spot on this list. Because would you believe there's a feature that's even worse? And at number one on this list, we have Eye for Detail. This subclass feature is obtained at their level as an Inquisitive Rogue, and allows you to use your bonus action to make perception checks to spot hidden creatures or objects, or investigation checks to uncover or decipher clues and nothing else. On paper, this feature should, in theory, make it so that you're better at perceiving and investigating your surroundings in general. However, that's not necessarily true in most cases, 
because this feature doesn't actually add anything new that you can't already do otherwise. In the rules for making perception checks, it states that your wisdom perception check lets you spot, hear, or otherwise detect the presence of something. It measures your general awareness of your surroundings and the keenness of your senses. And then it goes on to provide examples of using your perception to do things, like eavesdropping on conversations through a door, or hearing monsters through a forest or thugs hiding in the shadow of an alley. All of which you can do without even needing a feature for. The only benefit you're actually getting from Eye of Detail is being able to make perception checks in combat as a bonus action to spot a creature that decide to hide or become invisible in any way. Since bonus actions are kind of pointless outside of combat a majority of the time. But even then, most DMs will allow their players to make perception checks as bonus actions anyway or even as a free action, which further makes this feature kind of useless. Although editors note, heavy caution, this is very dependent on your DM. As for investigation checks, there's not really any in combat use to make an investigation check as a bonus action in this way, since it can only be used to uncover decipher clues, which once again, you can just do any time outside of combat anyway without this feature, rules as written. You might be able to see through certain spells easier, which requires an investigation check, such as seeing through a minor illusion or illusionary dragon. But that would really depend on how your DM would rule what uncovering or deciphering clues actually means. Overall, the reason this feature takes the top spot on this list is twofold. On one hand, if your DM allows checks to be made as bonus actions or free actions in combat, then this feature does nothing for the player. This creates the problem of the DM having to adjust the way they run their games just to make this feature useful in a meaningful way. The other problem is, even if you play the game as written and allow checks as actions, you aren't actually gaining anything useful for the most part when using eye for detail. Most of the time your party will have ways of dealing with invisible creatures during combat via spells or other features, like blind fighting, which can be learned at first level by fighters and rangers, which lets you see invisible creatures within 10 feet of you, unless that creature successfully hides from you. In which case, eye for detail might be useful in trying to spot them. If you're trying to spot an ambush, then eye for detail just doesn't really do anything because you're out of combat, so bonus actions wouldn't really come up. In short, eye for detail basically gives you the ability to do what you could already do in the first place, just as a bonus action. Which is something that rarely even comes up when making these checks anyway. Maybe if this feature gave you advantage when making perception checks to spot hidden or invisible creatures, and investigation checks when looking for clues, or even expertise in one or both skill checks, then maybe this feature wouldn't be so terrible. But as it stands, Eye for Detail is just completely overshadowed by other features, and only worth taking for Ear for Deceit and Insightful Fighting. The other two features you learn at third level as an Inquisitive Rogue, which both have much more use than Eye for Detail. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any features from this list you may have gotten use out of that weren't mentioned in the video? Or do you have features in mind that would have been better suited for this list that we may have missed? Or are there any topics you have in mind for future videos just like this one? If so, let us know down in the comments below.